know your fingernails grow at the same rate as plate tectonics. <laughs> when my friends asked me to volunteer for Dragon Con, I was skeptical. For those of you who aren't familiar with Dragon Con, it's a big science fiction convention that happens in Atlanta every year. And people go, they dress up in costume, they talk about science fiction and fantasy, and yes, those are Muppets dressed as stormtroopers, that's a thing. <laughs> I had arrived in Huntsville, Alabama with a fresh, shiny new PhD in physics. And I was not certain that physicists and science fiction convention really went together. I had spent years in graduate school learning to be a serious scientist. To the point that when a friend of mine gave me a copy of the book, The Physics of Star Trek, because I was a physicist, I died a little inside. So in graduate school, I had studied very hard to become a physicist. And my friends really wanted me to go work for Dragon Con as one of the members of Tech Ops, the technical operations, the people who run audiovisual. They do lights and they do sound. And I was an obvious choice because I had a theater degree. And I know what you're thinking, Stephen, you gave up a lucrative career in theater for physics? <laughs> so I had a physics degree and I had a theater degree in undergraduate, and I really loved doing theater. But I gave it up when I went to graduate school. I needed to focus, and besides, a lot of my professors kind of looked down their nose at the very idea of having interests outside of physics. But I was done with graduate school. And my friends were very persuasive, and so eventually I agreed that yes, I would volunteer for Dragon Con. Yes, I would be a member of Tech Ops, even though I wasn't sure I was the kind of nerd who went to these science fiction conventions where people dressed up. And spoilers, I am in fact exactly that kind of nerd. <laughs> So, as a member of Tech Ops, I crawled around and dragged cables. I ran sound boards. I helped lift Chick Corea's piano up on stage for one of his performances, and I'm pretty sure that thing was made of lead. And I had a great time. And the other members of Tech Ops really enjoyed having a physicist to boss around. And then the science track found out about me. Did you know when you look into the night sky, you were looking into the past? Dragon Con is organized into tracks. Each track is centered on a given fandom. They create panels and other events for, for example, the Star Wars track or the fantasy literature track. But Dragon Con also has tracks that are focused on, shall we say, the fact behind the fiction. There's a space track, there's a robotics track, and yes, there's a science track. When the director of the science track heard that Tech Ops had their own pet physicist, he hunted me down and he said, you should give a talk on the science track. And I said, yes, and then I realized I had made a tiny, huge mistake. I'd given academic talks before, but I'd never given a science talk to the public. Uh, you can hear the air quotes around the public, right? That's how I thought about it in my mind back then. But after a while, I decided I would be okay because I had taught classes. I had drummed facts into people's head. How different could the audience at Dragon Con be? All I needed to do was pick a topic that would be of interest to non-scientists, and so I picked laser cooling and trapping of neutral atoms to create a quantum superfluid. <laughs> now, in my defense, that was literally my PhD defense, so I felt very comfortable with it. So I prepared the talk, I gave it, and it went really well. And the director invited me to come back the next year and give another talk. So I did. I went back the second year and I did another science talk. And he talked me into being on a panel talking about science and the works of Joss Whedon, creator of the TV series Buffy the Vampire Slayer and Firefly. So where before I had felt faintly embarrassed about the idea of combining science and Star Trek, I was now combining science and Firefly. Well, things escalated quickly. The next year, I gave two science talks and was on two panels, and I fell into this rhythm of preparing talks and giving them, and preparing talks and giving them, and I got comfortable with them, which is when Dragon Con came to me and said, you should be the next director of the science track. Did you know you're related to jellyfish? <laughs> I was used to preparing a couple of talks, but now, as the director of science, of the science track, 
I was responsible for pulling together 34 hours of content over four days. And so panicked, I did what anybody would do. I started reading journal articles about life science events and started going to conferences about science communication. It is possible my grad school experience has warped how I approach these things. But I learned a lot about how to communicate science, and it really changed how I approach the science track. I'd always thought of the science track as kind of, I guess, an informal classroom. Clearly, people came to the science track to learn science. The job of the science track then was to provide facts, because that's at the heart of science, right? It's an accumulation of facts about the world around us. There's a name for that approach to science communication. It's called the deficit model of science communication. The idea is that you have sort of a gap between scientist and non-scientist. Non-scientists are skeptical about science because they don't understand it, and they don't understand science because they don't have all of the facts. Therefore, our job is to give people those facts. And if we give enough facts and pile them into this chasm of misunderstanding, this deficit, then the non-scientists can cross over to the scientists and we will all love science together. Yay! It is a view of the world that came very naturally to me. It is also super broken. Quick, name me the second fact I gave you in this talk. Uh -huh. I didn't tell you there was going to be a quiz, but I did warn you I used to be a teacher. But uh, jellyfish, yeah, I, it's kind of hard, right? The answer is, if you look into the night sky, you're looking into the past, but it's really hard to remember that because all I've given you are facts. I've given you no context, and worse, I've given you no motivation to care about them at all. And it's worse when we're talking about science that people are skeptical about or uncertain about. Giving people just facts can actually drive them further away. And we have years of research showing this. But even with those years of research, scientists like me just naturally fall back into the model of, oh, all we have to do is provide facts. We're kind of an academic lot. We went to school for a long time, and a lot of us have taught classes. We get into this mindset that how you communicate science is you exchange facts. It doesn't help that a lot of us view ourselves as pure rational actors making decisions based only on logic and facts, when the truth of the matter is we're human. We make decisions based on a host of different factors, only some of which have any connection to logic. And focusing on facts ignores how science is a process. The things we know today are going to be revised by what we learn tomorrow. Just ask Pluto, the ex-planet. <laughs> well, if we're not going to just pile up facts to communicate science, what are our other options? There are a number of ways of providing context and motivation when we're communicating science. But one of my favorites is storytelling. From a very early age, we learn from TV and movies and books how to understand and digest stories. Science communicators can use these stories to persuade, to inform, and to engage. Stories are a language we're fluent in. But there's resistance to storytelling within the scientific community. I was resistant to storytelling. And I think a lot of that comes down to, when you say storytelling, I hear entertainment or dumbing down the science, or even worse, lying about the science. And I think that entertainment aspect is a real stumbling block. It certainly was for me. Even after I got on board with the idea of telling stories to communicate science, I still felt uneasy talking about the science track as entertainment. Earlier this year, I was at a conference for live events. I mentioned that's a thing I do for fun now, I guess. And I was on a panel talking about the science track. We're working on a new study to see how people's attitudes towards science change once they've interacted with the science track. So I was describing that study, and then I heard the following words just fall right out of my mouth. But even if the only thing they get from the science track is mere entertainment, that's okay. <clears throat> a friend of mine rightfully called me on that afterwards. He's like, why did you say mere entertainment. What's wrong with the point of science entertainment being to entertain? And it really made me have to think about why was I so reluctant to embrace 
entertainment in science? And the answer is the same reason why ultimately I had given up theater in graduate school. I saw entertainment as being opposed to being a good scientist. But it doesn't have to be that way. We can have science entertainment that does not do harm to science. We can craft stories without undercutting the science at their heart. Science is a process, yes, but it is also a conversation. Storytelling is one tool for having that conversation. And entertainment is an invitation to take part in it. For me, that invitation is key. Two weekends ago, we had Dragon Con. And we had a panel with three panelists, Lolly Derossier, Dr. Rachel Burks, Dr. Danielle Lee. And they were talking about whether something like the Xenomorph, the scary alien monster from the Alien movies, was even possible. How would that acid blood and all of that work? And could you take a regular raccoon and turn them into rocket raccoon from the movie Guardians of the Galaxy? Very entertainment focused, a lot of fun, great time. And afterwards, a woman from the audience went up to the three of them, and I overheard her saying to them, I wish I had seen women like you talking about science like this when I was younger. I might have stuck with it. Oftentimes, science can separate us, and how we talk about it can push people away. Entertainment is my chance to bring people back and invite them back in. With the science track, I get to say, I love science, and we both love this movie. Let's see how those fit together. I get to show audiences that there are people like them who are into science and like the things that they like. It's why I'm excited that I get to have biologists come down and talk about the genetics of the wizarding gene in Harry Potter. And I am always here for Mayor McCheese explaining the scientific feud between Edison and Tesla. Instead of another science fact, what I really want to do is give you a science suggestion. Embrace how stories and entertainment support science. Stories and entertainment connect us. They provide the chance to interact and they help us remember that ultimately, science is a human activity performed by humans and is a way of understanding not just the universe, but each other.